The creator is one of the most visually engaging films I've seen in a long time. The locations, the costume design, and of course, the visual effects. In this video, I'm going to be attempting to replicate the robot head effect of the simulants from the film. So that was my little test scene for the effect, and for the rest of this video I'm going to be breaking down how I achieved it using Blender and Nuke. As you can tell from all the layers in these breakdowns, a big part of achieving that negative space look of the head is building the background up from back to front. So in all three of these shots I started off by using a clean plate of the back wall, and then from there I worked my way forward, building up things like the inside of my clothing, then placing the CG objects on top of that, and then rotoing all the foreground parts like the collar of my jacket on top. So that's a simplified rundown of all the steps involved in this process, now let's go through step by step and look at how it was done. Also, be sure to stick around for the rest of the video so you can find out how to win this Torbox Lite. It's an amazing little macro keyboard with loads of tactile buttons and dials, which are perfect for 3D artists and digital creators. I started by creating a mood board with a load of screenshots from the films and some of the behind the scenes. This was super helpful to give me a direction when I was modelling all of the pieces. I'm not particularly good at 3D modelling so it really helps me to have something to look at to kind of copy. What I did didn't end up being exactly the same as the films, I did kind of my own thing but it's in the same sort of world I suppose. Once the model was finished everything needed texturing. And then for the cutout of my head I did a proper 3D scan of my head and then used that mesh as a holdout which we'll see later in the compositing stage. So I brought in the head scan and then cut out all of the negative space like around the jaw and the neck. And as well as using this as a holdout because it's exactly the shape of my head it also really helped to see when the object track was working and when it wasn't because ideally it should line up perfectly with my head as it's a model of my actual head. And then after that we get onto the fun stuff. So to start off with, once the model was finished, I obviously brought in each of the shots into Blender, and then the first thing to do was an object track for each. So I brought in the EXR sequence, and I used all of the tracking points that I put on my face to track. I'm not going to do a deep dive on object tracking, but essentially my process was just go into the track tab, add an object track, so it starts off with the camera, you can just add a new object, which I called head. You need to have a minimum of 8 tracks that exist throughout the entire shot. And then once you have that, Blender can do the reconstruction of the geometry and actually do the head track. So you go into the Solve tab, under the Solve menu I turned on Keyframe, and then I press Solve Object Motion. As you can see my object solve is 0.53, which is pretty good for an object track. And then from here what I do, is I go into the 3D viewport. I add a camera and I lined it up in 3D space. While I was shooting, I took down notes of the focal length and how far the camera was from my face so that I had a good idea of where to place the camera in Blender. So for example, for shot two, I know that I shot this on a 50 millimeter lens. So the camera is set to 50 millimeters and the camera is also placed pretty much exactly a meter away from the face of the object. Once that's done, I add a camera solver constraint onto the camera. And then if I turn on motion tracking, this will actually allow me to visualize where the points are in 3D space. So I use these to make sure that the head was perfectly aligned and then I usually turn them back off just because they're a bit distracting. And then once that's in the correct position, I went on the object that everything was parented to and I added an object solver constraint which actually applies the object tracking data onto the head. This strange bit of geo here that looks like a bowl is actually some temporary geo that's casting some shadows like my clothes. So it's kind of there to mimic my collar. It's in its own collection and it's set to indirect only. And what that means is it won't show up in the render, but it will cast shadows and be reflected in all of the materials. So if I turn it off, you can see all the bits of the CG that are meant to be inside of my clothes and should therefore be occluded from a lot of the light are still lit up. So this bit of geo is just mimicking that occlusion so that there's some nice shadows and it looks like they're actually disappearing inside of my clothing. You can see that there's a holdout set up, so the 3D scan of my head is being used as a holdout. If I turn this off, you can see it's actually here, and it looks pretty horrifying with the textures on it. But when this collection is set to a holdout, it means that the 3D geometry of the head will actually cut out all of the stuff behind it, and there will be transparency here, which will help for compositing this and overlaying it later. So that's pretty much the whole setup in Blender. I rendered this with an HDRI that I actually took in the living room. So as you can see, if I turn off the transparent background, the HDRI is the same as the environment that it was shot in. I had a massive reflector here with a light behind it, which is like a very big soft box. And then there's also an LED tube in the background here, which is giving me a bit of an edge light. Rendering wise, I'll show the setup in the compositor. There's four different render passes for each of the shots. So we start off with the beauty, which is just a straightforward render of the head, which looks like this. 
Then from that same render pass, I also rendered crypto object passes and a depth pass. The third pass is a face mat, and it just looks like this. It's just the head scan on its own. The UVs are all messed up for some reason. I think I must have broken something. But I'm not actually using the RGB channels of this. If I look at it in Nuke, what I'm doing is just shuffling out the alpha, and I'm just using this, which assists me with some of the roto. And I'm utilizing that here when I'm restoring my face over the top of the clean plate. And then lastly, I did a hair detail pass. It's actually very difficult to see it in Blender because it's so fine. But if I zoom all the way in, you can see there's all of these individual hairs that just go along the edge of my chin and around the top of the ears. And they're just rendered out on a transparent background. And then again, I'm using them in Nuke just to blend the CG and the live action face a little bit better. So that's everything in Blender. I rendered out those four passes and then it was just time to composite everything. But hold that thought for just a second while I talk about this, the Torbox. If you've watched lots of my videos, you might remember a couple of years ago, Torbox were kind enough to send me their Neo model, which is this one. And it's been on my desk ever since. I used it loads on this project, as well as all of my YouTube videos, essentially. Torbox have also just released a new model, which is called the Torbox Lite, and it's this one. Obviously, I already have a Torbox on my desk, so I don't need two. I would need an extra pair of hands for that. So I'm going to be giving this away to somebody that watches this video. If you'd like to be in for a chance of winning it, all you have to do is make sure you're subscribed, like this video, and then leave a comment below. And then in a week or so's time, I'll pick a random winner from the comments and I'll ship this to you. So to demonstrate how I used it on this project, I've got the Blender scene with the head model open here. The main thing I use the Toolbox for, which saves me loads of time, is switching between all the different workspaces in Blender. So for example, normally if you want to go between them, you have to come up here and then go to the shader editor or whatever. And I don't really like diving through menus. So the alternative is you can do things like pressing Shift F3, but you have to press it multiple times to get to, say, the compositor or the shader editor. So instead, what I've done is I've assigned a lot of these buttons around the edges to the workspaces. So for example, if I wanted to open the compositor or the shader editor to tweak something, I just split the window in half and then I can go to the shader editor or I can press it again to get to the compositor and I can just cycle through those really easily. If I want to go to the UV or the image editor, I just press this top one here and as you can see, it's switching between those. The button on the side is the movie clip editor. So I can come in here and load in some footage if I'm going to do some object tracking or anything. And then this left hand button takes me back to the 3D viewport. So as you can see, I can jump between all those different workspaces super Super easily. Another thing I use it a lot for is navigating the timeline. So this scroll dial here allows me to go backwards and forwards on the timeline. Then I can also use the D-pad to step through individual frames. And then the up and down arrow keys are the same as the up and down arrow keys on the keyboard. So they allow me to jump backwards and forwards between keyframes. This middle dial here I have set up for changing brush sizes. So if I jump into sculpt mode and use this, I can change the size of my brush. And then these two thumb buttons I have assigned to control and shift, which I use more in Nuke for when I'm doing clone painting and things. So now let's have a look at a time lapse of how much I use this while 3D modeling. Okay, back to the video. So back in Nuke, like I said, I start off with the first plate, which is just a shot with me in it. To remove the markers, I used a variety of techniques depending on where they were in the face, as some of them were quite difficult to track. To do all of the ones that disappear, I just did a very traditional technique of tracking them and drawing a mat around them, and then using a transform mask node just to remove each of those by taking some of the pixels next to them and just transforming them over the top. And then for these ones on the side of my face, I used a slightly different technique. Because I've already done the object track in Blender by this point, I have a 3D track of my head. And because these markers are always visible throughout the entire shot, I decided it would be easier just to use the 3D track of the head and project an alpha for all of the markers. So to do that, what I did is I drew rotor shapes for each of the markers. You can see that here, I did it on this frame. And then from here, I project them onto the geometry of my face. That might seem like a slightly long-winded way of doing it, but it's actually much quicker than individually tracking each of them. So once I've got the alpha for these, what I did is I used a node called PXF Filler. This is a third-party gizmo that you can download for free. I don't use this very often to remove markers, but in this case, it just worked quite well. What it does is it just takes the colors from around the edge of the mat that you feed it and just drags them inwards. So as you can see here, that just fills the markers in with some skin color. At a glance, you might think that that's done, but if I actually look at the areas where the markers have disappeared, you can see that they lose all the skin detail and they become really blurred. So what I'm then doing on top of this is I'm restoring the skin detail by using the frequency separation technique that I showed in one of my previous videos. So what's going on here is I am taking the footage and I'm then blurring it by 5.2 pixels and minusing the original footage from this, which gives you just the high frequency skin detail. And then I'm using the mat of the markers 
which comes from the head track again, and I'm then using a transform mask node to take some skin detail from the areas around them and put it on top of where the markers are. Then if I plus this back on top of the footage, that's now restoring just the high frequency detail without affecting any of the colour underneath it. And so it restores all of the detail like the fine hairs on my face and the pores over the top of the tracking markers that have been filled in. And then lastly down here, I'm just rotating the glasses back on top because again there's a couple of bits where they got filled in slightly from that process. So that was quite a lot of talking actually, but that's how I removed all of the tracking markers. After that, like I showed in the beginning, we now put the clean plate back on top. So I've got this clean plate of the back wall and I'm using a key mix just to merge that over the top of the footage. And then I'm using some masks over here to define where the clean plate actually goes. So the first mask is just a big soft mat that basically puts it over my entire head, which looks like this. Then I've got a second mask which is here, which is putting the bit of my face that should be there back on top. So it's still cutting out all of the neck and the side of the head, but it's restoring um, my face and my hair and everything on top of the clean plate. And then lastly, I'm using the head mat, which I rendered out of Blender, to actually restore my face as well. So this mat gives me that nice outline for the jaw. And then I can go in later and key bits of the hair to put back on top so that my chin isn't this perfect cutout. And I also use the CG hair, which I blended on the edges here, which you'll see in a bit. After this, the collar goes back on top. This is essentially rebuilding the inside of my jacket, as you can see. The way I did this is after I finished filming each of the shots, I got up and took my jacket off and just filmed myself rotating it around in front of the lights. So then later I could take a frame of this, do a little bit of color correction to it. So I make it a bit darker and I did a roto shape in the middle and darkened that as well. And then cut out just a bit that I wanted and then I did a 2.2D track and just tracked this into the shot. So all of that together looks like this. Next up, the CG goes on top. So if I turn off all of the stuff that I did to tweak it, you can see what it looks like in the first place. So this is the render straight out of Blender with no compositing stuff done to it and I'm just overlaying it on top. The first thing I did is just set the black point as it was a little bit too dark. And then here, as you can see, I've got a few different crypto masks that I'm just using to tweak some of the colors. And I've also got an exposure node, which is just lifting the exposure slightly. So that's the exposure. This is grading the ears to be slightly brighter. It's all pretty subtle. I think I'm lifting the gamma up slightly as well because they felt a bit too punchy. This one is making the spine a little bit darker and making the bottom of the pistons a bit darker as well. They felt a bit too lit up considering they're meant to be inside of my jacket. And then lastly, for some reason, this screw was really nuclear. So I just used the cryptomat to turn that right down so it doesn't stick out. Then down here, I'm putting the CG hair back on top. At the moment it's just around the ear and then I put this stuff back on later. So you can see that's just blending that outline into the hair a little bit nicer so it doesn't feel like it's a perfect cutout. Then there's a slight Z defocus going on. I'm using the new Bokeh node in Nuke which I really love. I'm using this to set where the focus should be on the CG. It's really subtle but it just means that the whole thing doesn't feel perfectly sharp. Then I've got like an overall general defocus on it. This is really low, it's just set to 0.09. This just means that even the bits that are in focus are just being softened ever so slightly so they match the sharpness of the live action plate. The next thing I did which I found worked quite well for blending the CG into my face is I created a kind of fake 2D contact shadow and that looks like this. So I'm just taking the alpha of the CG, I'm eroding it outward slightly and blurring it and then I'm using that face mat that was rendered out of Blender just as a mask so that it only appears inside of the face mat. And then this is plugged into a color correct and I'm using that just as an alpha just to grade down the side of the face. Then obviously CG goes back on top. And then here, this is where I'm putting the extra CG hair onto the chin. Like I showed earlier, it looks like this. Well, this is what the render pass looks like straight out of Blender. I graded this to be quite a lot darker and have some more contrast as you can see. And then I isolated the side of the face and the chin on its own and put this down here. It's most noticeable along the edge here. And then on this bit where the skin transitions to that metal jawbone in the 3D model, it's probably the part of the effect that I'm happiest with actually. I think the hair blends really well with my real hair. Then the last thing, like I showed earlier, is the roto that goes back on top. I tracked and stabilized a few different bits of the shot. So for example, to roto my torso, I did a one point track on the t-shirt here and just corrected them where needed. And as I'm moving, obviously my t-shirt is moving when I lean forward, so it needed a bit of animating. Then the same thing for the collar here. Again, I did a two point track and stabilized it and then just drew some roto around the collar. And then lastly, this bit here is the roto for the front of my neck. So that's this roto shape here. I did the same frequency separation technique as earlier. This just allowed me to see where the pores were moving and it gave me slightly better reference when I was moving the rotor shape as to how much I should move it per frame. So I combine all of that rotor, which looks like this, and then it gets copied and pre-malted with the plate and put back on top of everything. And that's the final result. Again, all of the assets from this video and all of my previous videos are on Patreon. If you're interested in picking up the Blender files or the Nuke scripts or just want to use the footage to practice for yourself, Consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed the video. And remember, in a week's time, I'll be randomly selecting someone in the comments to win the Torbox Lite. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Listen.